left on the dock for more than 24 hours will be compressed to a cube at the owner's expense. Welcome to Sacred Cow Shipyards. So there's actually a bit of a funny story about this particular episode. When I recorded it, I realized that none of you would know what I was talking about going into it, even with the hints of the title and the thumbnail and so on and so forth. So on the Discord channel that you can join if you are a $5 a month member, either here on YouTube or on Patreon... I issued a challenge. You got one shot, one chance. You had to direct message me your answer. But if you could guess which enterprise I was talking about, I would give you a free ad slot in front of however many episodes I would need to give free ad slots in front of. And considering that the Discord has nearly a hundred members, that could have been a lot of episodes. However, as it turned out, it was a single, solitary episode. This one, in fact. Now, the funny thing is that there were a lot of guesses that were guessing about the same enterprise. They were all wrong, but enough people brought up that enterprise that I should probably circle back and revisit it in the future. But in the meantime, allow us to give credit to a certain gentle sophant who goes by the name of The Specialist. He got this challenge correct, and as promised, I will advertise what he asked me to advertise. Now, unfortunately, he was planning on asking me to advertise something entirely different, and maybe we'll actually come back to that again in the future once he recovers the images from his crashed hard drive, and it's a whole sordid story and kind of horrible. But in the meantime, allow me to tell you about Railroads Online. This is a game that is on early access on Steam, and I guess I should tell you one of the reasons the specialists themselves, and I imagine a lot of players, actually like it. It is apparently one of the few rail games available to you where you are allowed to lay down your own rail lines. Now, admittedly, I don't play rail games. I don't know a whole lot about them. I really don't understand your Humi fascination with trains in general. But still, apparently, it is somewhat unique and notable that this game allows you to lay your rail lines wherever you want to. Bridges and so forth, you have to build all those, of course. But most, apparently, other rail games confine you to pre-existing rail systems. This one does not. And as something that I particularly appreciate is that the game seems to exist entirely in the Steam era. And yes, in fact, I do have a particular odd, admittedly, weakness for your Humi steampunk concept. I mean, the whole Victorian Steam era on your planet is just B-E-A-utiful. And this game stays in that genre. They allow you to have technological progression through the game, but still within the whole steam train concept. And now, this, this is the day so many of you have been waiting for. You see, I do actually pay attention to your requests of ships to talk about. I mostly ignore the requests, but I do pay attention to them so I can file them away somewhere for some purpose that I haven't quite figured out yet. And this ship we're going to be talking about today has been a frequent request, with good reason, I suppose. And I also suppose that every once in a while I have to toss you guys a bone, so here you go. And yes, I said bone, not bo- mm, never mind. Anyways, this week we are going to talk about drumroll, but mm, you know what, never mind. Last time Bob tried to do that, it did not go well. Regardless, this week we will be talking about the Enterprise. Not just any Enterprise either, the first ship to bear that name. But before you get too excited about what that might mean, no, that does not mean we are talking about the shoehorned, entirely retconned NX-01 Enterprise. Yes, 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 it has its own whole series now, but still, that, that was a really weird historical insertion. Likewise, I am not talking about the no bloody A, B, C, or D, NCC-1701. You know, the Constitution Class one. Which obviously also means that I cannot be talking about the A, B, C, D, E, F, G, 
Mm, that stupid series. Or J, which also occurred in the Enterprise series that I was talking about. Or the M, which I didn't even know existed until a few minutes ago and is apparently non-canonical, but still the letters out there, so what do you know? And just to be more specific, since I did say ship, much to my regret, I am also not, in fact, referring to the 14 and a half warships that the once great British Empire had by the name of Enterprise. And yes, I did say a half. One of them got laid down and then canceled before she was actually completed. Nor am I referring to the four other non-warships that the Royal Navy had at some point also named Enterprise. Neither am I referring to the seven, soon to be eight warships that the USA and Navy had also named Enterprise, nor am I referring to the training facility, you know, a building on solid ground that the USA and Navy for some reason calls the USS Enterprise. Neither am I referring to the six other miscellaneous ships that the USAEans floated called the Enterprise, nor am I referring to the Union Army balloon that was called the Enterprise. That's, that's kind of cool. I got to give him credit for that. Also not talking about the Space Shuttle Enterprise, the OV-101. Nope, not that one. Nor the unfortunate VSS Enterprise, which was one of Virgin Galactic's commercial space planes that they were testing and fell apart while during testing, unfortunately. And finally, well... Actually, the IXS Enterprise is going to come up, which might give you a clue as to which Enterprise I'll be talking about. I guess I should have said the very first starship be named Enterprise, specifically an interstellar starship named Enterprise. Because I guess if you pushed a space shuttle hard enough, it could become interstellar, although not the Enterprise anymore. Okay, holy shit, just to back up a second, y'all really fucking like that name, don't you? God damn. I mean, what's the total count? 21 and a half warships with 22 and a half soon launching named Enterprise? Plus what? Almost 10 other miscellaneous ships also named Enterprise? And a fucking building? I mean, personally, it would have been a whole lot funnier if the USS Enterprise building was a gazebo, but that's probably never going to happen. And that's without even talking about the 10 Federation slash Starfleet Enterprises. And yes, the NX-01 counts because she eventually got folded into Starfleet. And maybe 11 if you count the M, but it's not canon, so who would? All right, so what am I talking about? Well, it is technically canon, but that's actually going to be the topic of the episode, not necessarily the ship. Anyways, the ship I am talking about is, in fact, the XCV X-Ray Charlie Victor 330, otherwise known as the SS Enterprise. Yes, the U was missing for good reason, although the reason is actually really hard to articulate. We're going to start with the, the real world aspects of this particular ship and go from there because it gets really crazy outside of the real world. What you see before you was originally intended to be the actual USS Enterprise from the original Star Trek series, the actual NCC-1701, whatever they're going to call it. It was one of Matt Jeffrey's earliest concepts for the actual Enterprise. And in 1964-ish, Mr. Jeffries uh, decided that the model that would be built out of it wouldn't be sturdy enough to hold up for filming. I can't speak to that, but I will trust Matt Jeffries' uh, you know, determination in that particular aspect. After that, the model was actually going to be used in another Gene Roddenberry project that never took off, and so it got shelved again. And finally, the SS Enterprise showed up as a painting on the recreation deck of the refitted Enterprise in Star Trek The Motion Picture, wherein, obviously, she became canon. Now, in the movie, the painting is not abundantly clear, as you can tell from the image I'm showing you right now, but in the book The Making of Star Trek The Motion Picture, there is a very clear picture of not only the ship, but also her name, in this case, USS Enterprise, and her registry number of XCV-330. The book goes on to describe this particular Enterprise as the very first Starship Enterprise, who was launched somewhere before 2143, give or take a little, and she was equipped with an actual Honest to God warp drive. Probably limited to about warp factor 2, though. Now, that book is not currently regarded as canon, which is where things start going off the rails here. For example, in the Kelvin verse, which should be basically identical to normal verse for Star Trek up until the Kelvin incident, of course. In Star Trek Into Darkness, there were models on a desk that appeared to be in chronological order of the progression of human spaceflight. And this particular Enterprise was placed after the Ares V rocket and before the Phoenix, suggesting that it wasn't warp-capable and was launched somewhere in the 2020s to 2063 period. 
So given that, it shouldn't surprise anyone that quantum mechanics, when they made a model of the XCV-330, described it as Earth's first sublight, interplanetary, and interstellar space vehicle. Now, I mean, we all know how close your closest star is, somewhere in the neighborhood of four and a half light years. If it's sublight, that's a long haul, and this boy has to be a honker. Especially since stasis isn't really a thing in the Star Trek universe, which is actually a kind of an auto mission on their part. But we're moving on. Now, we've already got one canon conflict, right? Well, I guess maybe not, because a lot of people don't consider Kelvinverse to be canon. I'm willing to accept it up until the Kelvin event, but uh, fine. Okay, there's there's one story. I'll, I'll at least, for the sake of argument, I'll agree with the Kelvin haters. It gets worse, though. In 1980, there was a book published called Star Trek Maps. A very unassuming direct title, I suppose, but it makes clear what it's about. It claims that the 330 was part of a batch of starliners that humans sent to stars within 15 light years of Sol. And they were all launched in the 2050s era. And only the Enterprise, specifically the UESP Enterprise, reached her destination. And it gave a size of 120 meters in length and a crew complement of 35. Now, the UESP aspect is kind of interesting because the United Earth Space Probe Agency is a thing that has come up in everything from the original series through Voyager. So that's an interesting tie-in. Now, what's funny is the year before, in 1979, the Star Trek Spaceflight Chronology was released. And therein, it claimed the USS Enterprise, not UESP Enterprise, was a Declaration-class cruiser built somewhere between 2123 and 2165, with an overall length of 300 meters, a crew complement of 950, and an advanced second-generation warp drive. Also, the book claims that 957 of these warp 3.2 starliners were built for the Cultural Exchange Project of the United Federation of Planets. Notably, this particular enterprise was the first class of ships equipped with a subspace radio and was considered to be the most popular passenger carrier of its time. Are we seeing some minor discrepancies yet? Now, the good news is those discrepancies did eventually get caught. As of 2002, and per the Star Trek The Magazine, Volume 2, Issue 11, both the Star Trek Space Flight Chronology and Star Trek Maps have been demoted to the status of Apocrypha. But still, for 20 years, they were the only thing going on, and there were already some pretty heavy incongruities in there, especially given that they're only released within a year of each other. And the problem is it gets actually worse after the franchise tries to reevaluate its in-universe reference works. You see, it's widely accepted in the real-world kind of aspect of things that this particular enterprise, the XCV-330, was the inspiration for, at the very least, the Surak class of Vulcan ships. And the Surak class pretty much helped define a whole lot of future and past Vulcan ship design with its ring-style warp drive. The quote-unquote re-evaluation resulted in Star Trek X Machina, a book that claims that the Enterprise was an unused prototype based on Vulcan ships of the same period. We seem to be putting the cart before the horse. And finally, the 2011 Star Trek Ships of the Line calendar actually had a comparison between the XCV-330 and the NX-01, and basically outright stated that the XCV Enterprise was a radical reinvention of warp technology based on Vulcan design principles. It proved to be 17% more efficient than Vulcan ships, but had trouble turning at high warp speed thus making it impractical for exploration where sudden course changes would have been made. It was considered a technological dead end in Earth starship design. I, I, I don't even know where to start with that half-assed explanation. Can you believe for a microsecond that Hume scientists would see Vulcans getting away with what they couldn't pull off and just let it slide? Can you believe that they'd see Vulcans doing crazy things with their ring warp drives and be like, eh, whatever, it's no big deal. Oh no, they'd take that shit personal. You'd have lab-coated, bespeckled scientists going out there and trying to hijack fucking Vulcan ships and retro-engineer them to figure out how the fuck they work. This would not be a dead end. This would be a goddamn challenge. And that's without even getting into the whole it don't turn too good aspect. I mean... Honestly, I suppose, technically, we don't know how much turning there is going on at warp speed. Seems like it could just drop out of warp, 
turn in normal space and go about his merry way. What do I know? But while we're here, looking at a close-up of the, uh, the command section of the XCV-330 Enterprise, boy, that thing looks a whole lot like something that went smoosh recently, doesn't it? Weird how designs follow similar plans no matter what you're trying to do. Anyways, to loop back to something I said previously, the XCV-330's warp system, if it actually had one at all, which seems to be a bone of contention, is called an annular warp drive. No, not annual, annular, as in ring-shaped. Yeah, sometimes your language is heavily redundant. And before I go any further, I just want to remind everyone that the XCV-330 was designed and drawn and developed by none other than Walter Matthew Jeffries Jr. in 1964. Mr. Jeffries was a beast of an artist. He was a set designer. He was an art director. He was a production designer. He was a reference book artist. He has his own playing card. How many of you Yumi's have your own playing card? But the reason I point all this out is because I want to stress that he was not a scientist. And this is not a discredit to him. He did other things. I mean, everyone does other things. It's not a big deal. But he was not a scientist. However, a no-joke scientist, Dr. Harold G. White, who was working at NASA at the time in 2013, proposed a new ship design with the goal of achieving, well, warp travel. Yes, Alcubierre-style warp travel. Honest to God, Star Trek-style warp travel. And in 2014, this design, based off of his premises, came out. Oh... Yes, indeedy, that is, in fact, the IXS Enterprise, or would be if you humans could ever build it and make it work. But, um, look at the rings. This is going to be another one of those whole, like, Star Trek predicts the future kind of things, isn't it? Hmm. Only this time it was damn near accidental, which is kind of the point. I do give Star Trek credit for, in 2002, finally realizing that things had gotten out of control. Because they had. They had 38 years of people writing whatever the hell they wanted, slotting it into canon wherever the hell they wanted, and no one was keeping track. And it was a goddamn mess. And yeah, at that point, all you can do is rip it all out and start over again. Now, I will argue that this is different from what Disney did with Star Wars, but that's a whole separate conversation. Mostly because Disney did it wrong. Either way, the XCV-330 stands as a testament of, you may not know what you're doing, but you do need to keep control of your storyline. I love that Roddenberry included a design that might have possibly one day maybe not really been the Enterprise. That's awesome. I mean, honestly, the amount of work your artists do is impressive to me, as I've always said, and being able to loop in one of the old designs into a current thing is kind of cool. But at the same time, you can't have every single f***ing yahoo who has a pen and a paper sketching out whatever diagrams they want of whatever ships you might have possibly shown on a painting on a back wall of a bar in a smoky room and naming it whatever they want and letting it be whatever they want. I mean, that's just a dingo up the ass right there. Especially if you ever want to bring it all together again in a coherent concept. And no, 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 before any of you get your underoos in a twist, although it's probably way too late for that, I'm not saying have your entire universe plotted out ahead of time before you put pen to paper. I'm just saying control it in some way that you find reasonable. Don't let anybody anywhere, everywhere do whatever the hell they want to do with your IP. You'd like it used to happen, apparently, in the wild, wild west of your science fiction history on your planet. Or do, I guess. I mean, it's your thing. And the question you have to ask yourself is whether you want to have a coherent, cohesive, complete story that is internally consistent, that I probably won't complain about at that, or whether you want to make money. Oh, damn. It's a pretty easy choice, isn't it? And that's all from Sacred Cow Shipyards. Please be advised that any ship left on the docks for more than 24 hours will be compressed to a cube at the owner's expense. Have a nice day.